This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by Parmesan Cheese. Do you wish cheese were powdered and put in a plastic can? Try Parmesan Cheese today. Welcome to episode 54 of The Sweaty Penguin, Antarctica's hottest podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Brown. It is Friday, August 13th. You can subscribe to The Sweaty Penguin on Apple, Spotify, Google, Podcast Addict, wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to leave a five-star rating and a review, and you will get a shout-out at the end of the show. The other way to get a shout-out? Join our Patreon. For as little as five bucks a month, you'll also get access to some Sweaty Penguin swag, exclusive bonus content, and more more, including an extended cut of last week's episode on succulents. To join the Patreon, it's super easy. All you have to do is go to patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash peril and promise. Today, we are talking about green space, the fifth worst space on the Monopoly board behind the brown spaces, the utilities, jail, and luxury tax. I mean, how can you call that space luxury tax if everyone has to pay it? Isn't a luxury tax just for the caviar and infinity pool owners? I'm not saying get rid of the square, but if you want to put a $100 penalty into the game, at least call it something accurate like payroll tax or got sad and ordered a week's worth of takeout. In addition to being the Monopoly color set no one lands on that costs 200 bucks per house, green space refers to areas of grass, trees, or other vegetation set aside in an urban area. Green space has been gaining popularity in recent years. It offers environmental, economic, health, and social benefits to cities, and residents find them both aesthetically pleasing and often very useful. But with this popularity comes a bit of stumbling. Just listen to New York City, as they took a pretty big swing and a miss earlier this year. Look closely to recognize that we are sitting on the famed Lincoln Center Fountain. This area redone with a big blanket of synthetic grass. Starting May 10th, the public is invited to lounge on this lawn. It's true. New York City's Lincoln Center turned their plaza green, but instead of using grass, they used artificial turf. And I have to say, one, does anyone actually like artificial turf? I played sports on turf as a kid, and within about three minutes, the bottom of my shoes were melting off and about 50 little specks of fake dirt were somehow buried inside my socks. In all fairness, Lincoln Center used a soy-based turf material called Sinlawn, which is supposedly a lot more grass-like, but you know what? What's even more grass-like? Grass! Which brings me to my second and more important point. Why is Lincoln Center touting this on the news as a lawn? Doesn't the word lawn suggest actual grass? And on top of that, this news story is titled Lincoln Center's Famed Plaza Goes Green. And the Lincoln Center website actually refers to the plaza now as the green. But I don't know how it's getting recognized as a green space if there's no actual plant life on it. If we're defining green space by any space that's the color green, then a moldy carpet, the New York Jets locker room, and a decked out rainforest cafe would also all be green spaces. I'm not saying it can't be a fun outdoor concert venue, but to put it on the news and make it out like this cool green lawn is really misleading. But in addition to these green space imposters, there are actually challenges related to real urban green spaces. They certainly provide a lot of really cool opportunities to cities, but there's also lots of barriers to building them, difficulties after implementation, and simply cases where they're not living up to their full potential. So today, we'll discuss what these challenges are and how we could think about green spaces moving forward to make them an even better opportunity for our urban communities. But first, what is urban green space? Well, according to a paper in the Journal of Environmental Protection, the definition of urban green space is a public or private open space in an urban area primarily covered by vegetation, which is directly via recreation or indirectly via environmental benefit, available for users. In other words, they're in cities, they're covered in vegetation, and they provide a benefit. And I know what you're thinking. By that logic, wouldn't a city bike covered in cilantro be considered a green space? To which I would say, 
yes, yes it would. But there's so many more types of green space, such as parks, sports fields, riverbanks, greenways, trails, community gardens, rain gardens, green roofs, street trees, nature conservation areas, schoolyards, playgrounds, public plazas, and the list goes on and on. So why is green space becoming so popular? Did it make a funny TikTok? Did Morgan Kay ask it to the prom? I can neither confirm nor deny that, but what I can tell you is that green space provides a laundry list of really cool benefits. Environmentally, green spaces can combat climate change by removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and can often do so even more effectively than their forest counterparts. A study in environmental pollution found that individual urban trees, on average, contain approximately four times more carbon than individual trees in forest stands. They can also cool the city itself reflecting sunlight or providing shade, as opposed to pavement, which absorbs sunlight and melts your shoes off, yet still not as badly as artificial turf, which I'm pretty sure is already just the temperature of the sun. Green spaces also can control pollution, reducing air pollution by absorbing unwanted particles, and reducing noise pollution by being quiet. And green space can promote biodiversity and conservation in so many ways, whether it be the plants that populate the space, the pollinators that pollinate the plants, or the birds and animals that eat the plants. I mean, if there weren't green space in New York City, we couldn't even have the bee movie. The bee movie. I mean, who would teach kids that a bee could get the hots for your girlfriend and get her to break up with you then? And it doesn't stop there. Green spaces bring a bunch of human health benefits, not just by removing toxic pollutants from the air and reducing noise, but promoting exercise and sports, creating space to socialize, and helping mental health. In fact, a variety of health studies have shown that contact with nature offers a range of medical benefits, such as lower blood pressure and cholesterol levels, enhanced survival after a heart attack, less obesity, and lower levels of stress and depression. Green spaces also bring economic benefits. Improved public health leads to reduced healthcare costs, a cooler environment leads to reduced air conditioning costs, and seeing as they're so popular, green spaces also improve property values. And on top of all that, green space just provides more opportunities for the children growing up in cities. Jessica Pendergrass is the interim executive director of Louisville Grows, and coming from a small town in rural Kentucky, where her family routinely grew their own food, she was disappointed to see how different the kids in urban areas have it when she eventually moved to Louisville. Having that experience as a child really gave me the unique opportunity to be connected to the land and to really have a strong sense of place. And if you think about youth now growing up in urban areas, they don't have this same opportunity to have that sense of connection and are more likely to be connected to an electronic device than they are to the land or growing their own food. Given that it was the mid-80s and sunny today and I spent the entire day inside on my laptop writing B-movie jokes, all I can say is touché. But Jessica brings up an interesting point. Living in nature creates an appreciation for it that children in cities don't get the opportunity to experience. That's not to say every 8-year-old should be milking cows at 5 a.m. Grand Theft Auto is educational too, guys. But hearing Jessica talk about the difference between urban and rural living certainly lends credence to the idea that being surrounded by nature helps you appreciate it more. Having grown up in a suburb myself, I never appreciated nature until I learned how climate change was affecting it as a college student. So I don't think green spaces are going to get the youths off their damn phones, like Jessica says, but I can see how green space would help kids connect to nature in a way they otherwise might not be able to. So if green spaces are this cool, why aren't they everywhere? Why doesn't the skyline of every major city look like the cover of the footbook? Well, if there's two things I've learned from Kermit the Frog, it's that it's totally normal for pigs and frogs to date, almost as common as bees and people, and that it's not easy being green. Today, we'll talk about two challenges that face urban green space, roadblocks that prevent their construction, and reasons why they might not be living up to their potential. And let's start with what prevents their construction. One challenge is going through the bureaucratic hurdles to getting the green space built. 
According to an article in the architecture magazine Arch 2O, few jurisdictions around the world have clear processes for regulating green infrastructure, even in countries famous for their environmentalism like the Netherlands. Whether it be building standards, zoning codes, minimum parking and road widths, or some other municipal ordinance, it's very easy for regulations and green space to end up incompatible, like orange juice and toothpaste, or Nick Cannon and monogamy. Another hurdle, and perhaps a more obvious one, is a lack of funding. That's certainly not to say urban green spaces are uneconomical, but they usually require some upfront investment. If you want to build a park, you need money and people to build the park, money and people to maintain the park after it's built, resources to navigate the bureaucratic obstacles we just discussed, possibly having conversations with residents about how to best utilize their tax dollars for the project, and the list goes on. It's how a TV show about turning a pit of dirt into a park could last seven seasons. In the long run, the lifetime cost of green space is almost always cheaper than the alternative, what we call gray space, because of the environmental, economic, and health benefits I outlined earlier. Which, by the way, in some cases can actually be very immediately practical, like a community garden feeding people, or a park allowing for sports. But often, these long-term cost savings don't make their way into these decisions, and that upfront investment pushes cities or private landowners away from the idea of green space. And now that the pandemic has demanded so much government funding around the world, University of Exeter's Sian De Bell worries that urban green space could be put on the back burner. With the majority of funding coming from local authorities and from third sector and organisations, with green space being a non-statutory requirement, it's somewhere where budget cuts can be made. And going forward with recession that we're entering with potential economic impacts from lockdown support, it's likely that budgets are only going to reduce for, for green spaces in the future. A non-statutory requirement. To clarify, a non-statutory requirement is a requirement based on custom or common sense, whereas a statutory requirement would be a written rule. For example, committing fraud would get you fired from your job, because there's a rule somewhere in that employee handbook that says, no fraud, fraud bad, fraud gets you fired. That's statutory. Whereas going up to everyone in the office and talking about why you love octopuses for 10 minutes would also get you fired from your job, but nowhere in the employee handbook does it say you can't do that. It's just customary that no one wants to talk about slimy and arrogant octopuses while they eat lunch, making that a non-statutory requirement. So hearing Sian refer to green spaces as non-statutory is really meaningful. It means green space is customary, but not required. And because green space is non-statutory, not only could it be reduced in budget cuts, but she argues that it's likely to be reduced in budget cuts. Her finding that cities view green space as this non-essential says a lot about the degree to which price can be a roadblock. How about challenges after an urban green space is in place? For one, the green space might have cons, as a study in the journal Water suggests. Green roofs, for example, can leach phosphorus from compost, and while green roofs on higher-priced houses do boost property value, green roofs on lower-priced houses do not. Rain gardens, which are shallow depressions in the ground in which stormwater can be filtered, also can sometimes fail to remove all pollutants such as when the water contains de-icing salt, and that water can then leach into the ground. And trees! That's right, our beloved trees can invite unwanted insects, spur pollen allergies and asthma, and demand a lot of effort to manage, especially if their leaves need to be raked. Research on potential cons on green space is really just getting started, and while I certainly don't anticipate these cons would turn green space into a poor investment, I do think they're worth taking seriously. It's like Mike Richards getting the hosting job on Jeopardy. It's probably not a bad idea, he did a good job, but it's still important to address the fact that he's the executive producer. I've negotiated with myself before when I decide whether or not to make microwave mug cake at 3am, but negotiating the hosting job of one of the longest-running TV game shows in history feels like a different level. While we don't know as much about cons, we do know a bit about how urban green spaces might not be living up to their potential. 
According to data from Naturevation, a project which we'll discuss plenty more during the interview, there are actually many cases in which a nature-based solution is motivated by a single objective rather than a longer list of issues, even though these endeavors are perfectly capable of tackling more than one thing. And whether they be motivated by one issue or multiple issues, Naturevation found that these nature-based solutions address air pollution and climate change to a far lesser degree than, say, biodiversity. To me, that sounds like a missed opportunity. Like Joshua Bassett's character not breaking the fourth wall after saying deja vu in an episode of High School Musical the Musical the Series. I mean, that was a blatant jab at Olivia Rodrigo's chart-topping hit if I've ever heard it. Way to rub that messy breakup in, Disney. If you have the wherewithal to create a green space, and especially if you're funding it with taxpayer money, I would hope that the project would deliberately take advantage of as many synergies as possible. That would get you the most bang for your buck and provide the largest possible benefit to the community. But what might be an even bigger missed opportunity is the fact that urban green spaces are very unequally distributed. Decades of research has continued to observe that in city after city, Green spaces are disproportionately located further away from low-income households, households with children, and most prominently, Black, Latino, and Asian households. In fact, the Hispanic Access Foundation reported that these communities of color are nearly three times more likely to live in a nature-deprived area than white communities. That's a much bigger number than the income disparity. And the reason for it isn't lost on these communities. Just listen to David Diaz, a longtime resident of El Monte, California, which is also the most nature-deprived city in America, share his frustration with the lack of green space in his hometown. It's not by coincidence. The system is working the way that it's intended to. It's been intentional on purpose. And so when we talk about system inequities and racism, you see that play out here. And so when we talk about land use planning, it's really important that we're taking this equitable approach to investing and developing more parks and open space in communities like El Monte. In David's experience, the unequal distribution of green space is intentional. Over the last several decades, municipalities excluded minorities from certain neighborhoods, denied them financial services, and built new green spaces in the whiter areas. As a result, SoCal communities like Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, and Malibu end up with thousands of acres of parks and open space, while El Monte gets nicknamed a concrete urban jungle. Given the unjust forces that led the majority Hispanic community of El Monte to have so little green space, it's completely understandable that David would be frustrated and want to see this inequality changed. But here's the thing. When cities do acknowledge this issue and start investing in green space in these low-income and minority communities, they end up driving up property values, leading many of the current residents to either have to stay put and pay higher rent, or leave and not reap the benefits of the project. This issue is called environmental gentrification, and we've got a whole episode coming out on it in about a month, so I won't go into detail here, but it's important to remember that even though low-income and minority communities have historically been excluded from enjoying green space, cluelessly marching into these communities with parks and rooftop gardens could have consequences of its own. And I know what you're thinking, Ethan, why can't you just explain environmental gentrification now? Well, I would, but if you had to listen to me talk for 20 more minutes, you'd probably fall asleep, or worse, resort to watching the Love is Blind after the Ultra special on Netflix. So just wait the extra month. Are green spaces bad? Should we tear down every community garden and replace it with a super target, Starbucks and all? Of course not. My intent here wasn't to scare you away from green space as an environmental problem solver, but rather to make sure you're aware of the challenges that will come up along the way. Some of these challenges might sound complicated, but I'm confident that they're feasible to address. And in addressing them, green space will be even better. So how could cities address them? Well, it's hard for me to say much, because perhaps most importantly, every city is really different. Different cities have different demographics, different funding, and different levels of green space. Some are just getting started, and some have more projects going on than a second grade art class. Preston, you've got a mug in the kiln, a watercolor drying, and a half-finished weave. If you start drawing with those magic markers in your hand, you're not going to have time to finish it. That said, I think there are some things that can apply to any city. 
Review local ordinances, and try to develop green space-friendly ones. Include long-term cost savings in your decision-making. Find experts to help determine how projects can tackle multiple issues at once. Get feedback from the community. Even determining ways to measure success with green space, present and future, could make a difference. Another option is encouraging the development of private and grassroots open green spaces. Take this project in Baltimore called Bliss Meadows, founded by Atia Wells in 2017. A pediatric nurse, Atia began to learn why her ancestors felt a deep disconnect with nature and began working in her community to change that. This land reclamation project, located on a 10-acre space in northeast Baltimore, is helping create equitable access to green spaces, while also providing educational opportunities and community building. With people of color historically having limited ability to connect with natural environments, as well as lacking local nutritious foods, this project is creating an urban paradise that's both agriculturally productive and educationally empowering. And to call Bliss Meadows an urban paradise is really high praise. But as much as I want to joke about that phrase, it could actually be fitting. Based on this clip, we already know that this project covers two objectives, social equality and nutritious food growth. It's equitable. It's educational. It seems like the whole package. And as cool as many public green spaces are, it's hard for me to imagine something public earning the status of urban paradise, because this green space was created within the community, born out of personal experience. City governments can do their best to learn about the communities they govern, but stories like this one are great reminders that often, the best experts on a particular community are the actual people who live there. Grant programs, subsidies, or tax breaks could be ways for governments to incentivize this sort of grassroots free market green space. Besides, where would Leslie Nope's pit park be without Ann Perkins? I know it got so hard to fit her into the plot of the show that they had to force her into a relationship with Tom of all people, but come on, how could you make a park without that cunning, pliable, chestnut-haired sunfish? It may also be worth reflecting on what our understanding of green space is. Since the title of the episode was Urban Green Space, I focused on green spaces like trees, gardens, etc. But similar solutions with similar synergies can take many forms. It can be a wastewater treatment plant, which we've got an episode on. It can be a pond. It can even be a new transportation system. While these approaches may not fit the definition of green space, that doesn't mean they can't be useful for cities in very similar ways. Ultimately, the goal is to find the best possible solution, even if it turns out not to need as many plants. Take note, quirky college freshmen who learned nothing from last week's succulent episode. And look, I get that it's a little annoying to be poking holes in something as cool as green space. But since green spaces are investments, I think it's worth identifying these challenges to be sure we optimize them as much as possible. Because if we do, we'll have saved money, more robust urban environments, healthier and more equitable cities, and maybe, just maybe, we can convince Kermit the Frog that it is easy being green. Do you wish your salt came out of a cow's mammary gland? If so, Parmesan cheese is for you. It takes 5,060 liters of water and 13.5 kilograms of carbon to produce just one kilogram of Parmesan cheese. But hey, that's a small price to pay to make sure my pasta sticks together a little bit, right? Parmesan cheese, nope, nope, screw it, screw it. Ethan, hey, hey, Ethan, cut. Cut. I, it, it, tastes, you know, it tastes too good. I can't do this. It, forget I said anything. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to The Sweaty Penguin. With me today is Dr. Harriet Bulkley, Professor of Geography at Durham University. Dr. Bulkley, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. First off, you're a leader in the Naturevation Project. Could you tell us a little bit about that project and what your role is? Sure. So Naturevation is a project that's funded by the European Commission uh, under a program they call the Sustainable Cities and Communities Program. And started in 2015, 
they issued a call for projects that wanted to look at how cities are working with nature around sustainability goals. A nature-based solution is where actors have purposefully thought about working with nature in a city to deliver ecological, economic and social benefits, preferably all at once, although that's not always possible. And I guess it's it's been placed in kind of distinction to technical solutions. So trying to say that nature has functions and services that we should be looking to also to help us um, in this kind of quest for sustainable cities. So my role in the project is as the convener of the team. There are about 80 of us working on the project across 14 different organizations, universities, policy institutes, and municipal governments across Europe. I'm wondering if you could speak to what you would say some of its key accomplishments have been. Yeah, well, you know, this is a good week to ask me because I just had to draft the final project report because we've come to the end of our funded time as a, as a project working together. I won't give you all the 30,000 words of that because I don't think we'll have time for it. But some of the things that we set out to do were really to try to establish the evidence base of, you know, what were cities across Europe really doing with nature at the moment? So before we start to try and invent new things and develop new interventions, it's a good idea to try and take a stock take of what's happening at the moment. So we developed um, what we call our Urban Nature Atlas, and it's got a thousand examples across a hundred different cities. And we've really learned a lot from that, not only just the fact that there's lots going on, but we've learned a lot about the different actors that are involved and the different goals that they're pursuing. And in a sense, what we've seen is that cities are working with nature towards ecological goals around green space and biodiversity, economic regeneration and health and well-being. Those are at the absolute top of what cities are doing nature-based solutions for. But they're much less often focused on climate change or air pollution or water or um, social justice goals. And so we think that there's a kind of opportunity gap, if you like. These projects are happening at the moment, but they're not tuned in to some of the other kind of sustainability challenges that they could help with. So by retuning them, by thinking, okay, well, you're working already on green space and urban regeneration. What could you add to this to really kind of address climate change or social justice? That there's a potential there to kind of add on to what's already out there. So I think that's been a key part of what we've been able to achieve is show there's already action. There's spaces to kind of work with uh, with things that are happening on the ground at the moment. Another big part of our project has been trying to assess what nature-based solutions actually contribute on the ground. And we've just finished that piece of work and I'm not an ecologist or, or a modeler. So my colleagues will probably you know, be screaming at me for how I'm going to summarize this. But in essence, what we've tried to do is to look at scenarios for the future. What if we used all the available land, so the land that's currently available without us changing how it's used for nature-based solutions, what would we be able to achieve? And we can see that we, we can really start to make quite a difference to the urban heat island effect in many European cities. It's quite geographically uneven. So there are some places like in the south of the UK or around some of the Mediterranean coasts where this would make a big difference. So we might be able to reduce um, the urban heat island effect between 0.2 and 0.5 a degree. That doesn't sound that much, but stretched over time and across all these different spaces, that really reduces the impact of climate change for a lot of people. I think green spaces like parks or gardens are kind of the main urban nature-based solutions people think of. So I was really intrigued by how many different nature-based solutions Naturevation identified. Uh, So you started to already, but could you share some other examples and perhaps some of the ones you found most interesting or surprising? Yeah, you're right. I mean, when we think about green space and cities, we are going to get drawn to those, you know, the obvious places, the parks and the gardens and the the public spaces that we're used to in a way. But what we are finding is that there are a really large variety of green spaces emerging in cities now. I think some of them we don't notice because they're really literally kind of under our feet. So we're seeing quite a lot of um, new ways of managing water in cities, which are called sustainable urban drainage systems. They try to use um, the natural properties of vegetation to drain water away. Um, And so you might just you might not even notice them on a pavement. They'll just be like a a sort of a small channel, which is kind of planted with reeds or something like this. But they really over a whole city or even over a specific area of a city that's prone to flooding, they really can help 
uh, take water out of the drainage system and really relieve that kind of flooding pressure in the city. So those sort of small micro nature-based solutions that added up really make a difference. So I've been really interested to see those. You mentioned when you were talking about your work, identifying a lot of the current solutions in cities that climate change wasn't necessarily coming up as one of the issues they were addressing. Why do you think that is? And what needs to happen to put climate as a higher priority? Two reasons why, really. I think urban nature and green spaces and the nature-based solutions we've been talking about often being done for much more immediate reasons. They're being done because they matter to people in their particular times and places that they are. And the way in which, you know, your local park or, or introducing new um, food growing spaces in the city might relate to climate change sometimes feels too distant, right? So one of the things we need to do is be able to kind of show how those small changes added up can actually lead to kind of a, a bigger outcome and be able to show people that what they're doing is meaningful in that context. So that's one reason. And I think the other reason is that there's a kind of mismatch for where policy has been looking for nature-based solutions for climate change. The whole kind of discourse about natural climate solutions is very kind of pristine rainforest and mangrovey, if I might put it that way. So there's much less of a focus on that, you know, proper real nature that could help us with climate change could be found in a city. I mean, if you see the sort of images that conservation organizations or, you know, even in people who are investing in nature-based solutions might put out, they're all basically rainforest or mangrove. And there's very little kind of focus in those international discussions about the ways that cities could also be a place where these nature-based solutions for climate change could happen. I think that's beginning to change now. And I do think there's a growing interest amongst, say, the World Bank and other development finance organisations in how they might be able to make resources available to support cities in undertaking nature-based solutions that can work for development and can work for climate at the same time. And that ties in too with one of the other big challenges with urban green spaces and urban sustainability efforts is that they all too often leave out low-income and minority communities within the city. And that can actually contribute to some of the injustices we see when we talk about climate. So moving forward, what needs to happen for these projects to be carried out more fairly and more equitably? It's certainly been a focus in our project and we have been concerned to see that, you know, our analysis of what nature-based solutions do to the the value of property, for example, really shows that large nature-based solutions do increase property values around them in a way that means that you get a kind of clustering of the value of nature-based solutions, which can lead to to people who previously lived in areas being being dispossessed, if you like, of their land or or the the place to, to live and work. And so going forwards, I think, you know, making sure that this doesn't happen, that this isn't a, you know, a more or less unintended side effect of of greening cities means really two or three things. I think, first of all, it means understanding that smaller nature-based solutions, which are more evenly distributed across the city, can work, you know, that that then spreads the value, right? Just in purely economic terms, and I'm, again, I'm not an economist, but in purely economic terms, as my colleagues on the project will tell me, that if we put lots of valuable nature-based solutions, smaller ones that are connected to each other so that they make a difference to biodiversity or ecology or shading a city, we're going to get much more distribution. So that's a really key thing first. You know, this is a kind of classic small is good uh, when it comes to sustainability. So that's one thing we need to do. And the second thing is that we really need to attend to the kinds of nature that matter to the people in the communities where we're looking, you know, where we're looking to, to make a difference. It's really important that we don't only sort of look to conservation science and you know, climate science for the answers to what kinds of nature are going to be valuable in cities because they've got to work for the communities around them. They've got to be meaningful. They've got to be the kinds of um, interventions that communities want to have um, because if they're not, they won't be taken in and be part of the community and come to be part of what makes the fabric of that place. You know, you can put it in a small urban pocket park, but if nobody wants to go there because they think it's too dangerous, then it's it might be there, but it's still not useful or accessible to that place right so you have to make things that that work in a community and then I think maybe the third issue is that we really need to understand what are the key environmental challenges that can you know that need to be addressed in order to to tackle this inequalities and 
to my mind, I think there's probably two really th key things, and one is air pollution, and then the second is heat. And we know that nature-based solutions can help with both of those things. And even at relatively sort of small scale and relatively cheap, such as tree, street tree planting, we know that that could work for shade and for, um, and for air pollution. But it does mean that somebody needs to be able to look after those, you know, after, after they've been in, put into the ground and how that works, who's involved, who stewards those nature-based solutions over time is related to the other two points that I made about communities, you know, feeling that this belongs to them and this is part of what they want to see in their neighbourhoods and relates to the idea of making sure that those benefits are shared across this urban landscape. I know a lot of people in the environmental world grapple with what exactly nature means. And I know a lot of people see nature as like this pure, pristine wilderness untampered by humans. And that's kind of impossible in a city. And yeah, if we grow grass for a park or plants for a garden, it's always going to be humans putting in that work. So do you feel that the goal with these projects is to bring more nature in the city and connect people with nature? Or is it a more practical tool to try to solve environmental and sustainability and justice issues? Yeah, that's a really interesting question about, you know, how much nature does a nature-based solution have to have to be properly natural? You know, this led to a very heated debate for a long time. But I think what we, what we have to recognise is that in some senses, that sort of purity about thinking that nature comes in one size and one form and that we need to kind of protect it and shield it might actually be doing more damage to our goals for protecting the planet as a whole than we might expect. So there's good research which shows that that interaction with nature means that people are more likely to take good decisions about their consumption habits or good decisions about what to do with their waste on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we need that connection with nature for all of those reasons. And we're not going to find it by having to leave the city every time or watch David Attenborough on TV every time we need to find it, right? So I feel quite strongly that we need to kind of take off those kind of boundaries of this kind of idea that proper nature is to be found somewhere else outside of our everyday lives and instead think about the kinds of nature that are around us how we can help that kind of nature thrive what can we do to make more space for it alongside our own living in the city because I think you know we're just going to have to learn to get along with that kind of approach to nature-based solutions. My last question for you what would be your advice to cities or city governments about how to either better implement green space or implement more of it, or what would be your uh, message? Well, I do think that there's currently quite a lot of space in cities that is not being used as productively as it might be. So in the analysis that we did of three cities in Europe, in Malmo in Sweden, in Utrecht in the Netherlands, and in Barcelona in Spain, we found a really surprising result, which was that 10% of the space in each of the cities was available for nature-based solutions. So that's 10% of that land being available for nature-based solutions. And the surprising thing for us is that it was so consistent. These are three completely different cities in their makeup. Some of that space is green roofs, but other spaces are what streets where you could plant street trees, urban parks which could be expanded by say removing some of the car parking space and making that either permeable or making it more part of the park so it's a remarkable consistency of already existing land that could be used for nature-based solutions and that's land which is within the public domain then we also have a whole set of other actors in cities that have land that are not being used for these reasons so in the UK, at least, um, we see utilities, so electricity providers or water providers, they have land around their infrastructure, same with railroads, uh, same with, with transport, and the famous example of the verges of it, how, how to keep those biodiverse. So I think that first, thinking, what are we wasting in our city? What could we repurpose? What we could think about differently? And then the second piece of advice would be just to find the key actors and stakeholders who can make this happen with you. City governments are really important to this transition to bringing nature into cities, but there's, they cannot do it alone. They don't own enough of the land. They don't have enough of the resources. And they certainly you know, need to take account of the diverse views and values about nature that will exist across their population. So it's got to be work in partnership. Dr. Bulkley, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure.
This wraps up episode 54 of The Sweaty Penguin. Remember, you can get a shout out right here at the end of the show. There's two ways to do it. One is to leave a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict. That helps boost us in their algorithms. Or join our Patreon, and you'll get not just a shout-out, but merch, bonus content, even a chance to win a signed book from one of our experts. Head to patreon.com slash thesweatypenguin to unlock all that cool stuff and help grow the show. Once again, The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week. Today's episode was written by Dane Kim, Ethan Brown, and Lindsay Cronin, edited by Frank Hernandez, and produced by Ethan Brown, Shannon Damiano, Frank Hernandez, and Caroline Kale. Our ads were voiced by Lindsay Cronin, and our music was composed by Brett Saka. Special thanks to our Emperor Penguin patrons, Lawrence Harris and Brownie Central. Clips today came from CBS New York, TEDx Talks, Sweep, Sustaining U.S., and Hip Hop Science.